Hello and welcome to the first Berlin Epidemiologic Methods Colloquium talk of the year 2023. We are very happy that uh, we have people here in the lecture hall as well as online. My name is Tobias Kort. I am the director of the Institute of Public Health and with my colleagues Susato Ito, Megan Forrest, Toivo Glatz and uh, group of people who are supporting us today to make this happen. I welcome you to this talk today. We are extremely happy that we found a date that uh, Mats um, Stensrud could join us here today. Professor Stensrud is Assistant Professor and Chair of Biostatistics at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. He obtained his Master's in Statistics at the University of Oxford his MD from the University of Oslo, as well as his PhD in neuroscience from the U University of Oslo. He has a strong interest in causal thinking and it will be part of his talk today that covers an optimal treatment regimen assisted by algorithms. Mats, thanks very much for coming. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I'll take off my mask while, while speaking. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, and I, I will let you all guys ask questions along the way, if you want to just raise your hand and we'll organize that. I'll jump right into it. So um, let's look at this because precision medicine will be uh, one of the high level motivations for the work I'm presenting today. And a lot will be conceptual. There will be some equations along the way, but you don't, I mean, they're not important for the main message necessarily. And I have, I have my opinions about what precision medicine is, because now this is a buzzword, not only right now, it's been for the last almost 10 years, I think for the last five years, it's been all over the place. And we often associate with this with, um, with uh, omics. So in lots of new data, maybe from genetics, proteomics, and so forth. And, and the promise is that we can use this data to make better decisions. So my... Uh, and here is to, or, and also my claim is that making better decisions is the key aim of this decision. So that's of key importance is how can we do this, use this data to make better decisions, either as policymakers or as, or as patients when we can choose ourselves or as doctors. And, and characterizing all the omics and just doing you know, data manipulations on, on large data frames is of secondary importance. And I think I can back my claim in, in, in some ways. So this is, this is a picture illustrating uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. So this is from a speech and initiative Obama launched in one of his State of the Union addresses. So this is an address the president gives every, every year. I mean, they do always some big, big, big time thing there. So um, I don't remember exactly the year, but I know this is in one of these speeches, which is, this is more infamous than famous, but. That's where Bush, uh, George Bush uh, launched the access in EMU, for example. But Obama launched the Precision Medicine Initiative. At the same time, he gave billions of dollars to NIH to fund research on precision medicine. And, and I quoted, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but you can see the text below. And if you can read it, you can see what, what his motivation is, or at least how he presents his motivation for studying precision medicine. And he starts with a doctor, and he says the doctors have always tried to tailor their treatments as best as they can to individuals. And then he gives an example of these things. But the important is, thing is about tailoring treatments to individuals, how to make the best treatment decisions and how that can affect your, um, clinical outcomes. Okay, so that I mean is the, the, the aim of precision medicine. So it's all about tailoring treatment decisions to our patients, often they sort of say individual, but at least some kind of measurable characteristics of the unit. And what is the premise? Then? So um, if you take a step back and think about it slightly more statistically, it's like there are heterogeneity. So there are differences between individuals and we can leverage these differences to individualize treatment decisions. Okay. So how, where, so where does causal inference come in or, or statistics or epidemiology methods? Well, since the precision medicine is all about making better decisions for individuals. Better decisions, we can frame often as what if questions. So what if I do this in A or B, or do treatment one or zero? Uh, causal inference is a natural way of approaching these 
questions, especially also because the data we have is often observational, at least observational data in addition to possibly experimental data. And there is a rich theory on optimal treatment regimes in the epi methods literature. It was it's, um, a tradition started now almost 30 years ago with work by Jamie Robbins and Susan Murphy have done things, and then it's been more and more applied to, to epidemiological or medical clinical epi setting. It's also a, now, these days, a big topic in the statistics literature because it's a lot of um, subtle issues and, and, and you can be clever in the ways you estimate these kind of things. So I'm just illustrating it here with the special issue of, of JASA, one of the major stats journals. And it's all about how to individualize treatments and how to study precision medicine. So again, this is a bit of the motivation, but here comes one of the points. Like there's also a lot of skepticism um, towards algorithmizing or making decision rules that are just given by, by algorithms and data. I, mean, I must say, this is a digression, but not you know, completely to the point. But if you guys have used chat GDP recently, it's quite amazing what kind of achievements has really come like all of a sudden, just the last say, half a year, right? So um, I'm, I'm not going to, and, and the computer scientists didn't really foresee how good this could actually be. So the, the fact that we can make good machine tools I, I really believe it, but cost inference is still a very different task. Um, and it seems to be the case, at least at this moment, that even if you want to algorithmize decision rules, this is what, what it seems to be in medicine, but also when they try to make automatic, you know, um, airplanes or cars at the moment, it's, at the way it's implemented at this moment in time, it's always under the supervision of humans, either in the car or in the airplane or at the hospital, or they're or from some distance sitting in some centralized area. But let's, but can we really say that optimal, you know, algorithmic decision rules are better than human ones? So this is a high level question and it seems a bit fluffy, but one of the key points is that when doctors or other healthcare providers make decisions, they have access to different type of information than they have been recorded in all of these, these um, data sets that have been used to train algorithms. Okay, they look at patients from a, from all kind of like three dimensional perspective. They may have different history of things. They may have uh, other type of written or oral information that's not recorded in any of the existing data sets. And the doctors can say that, and I agree with them. They do have that. And if that information is important in the sense that if that information does predict the outcomes of interest then there is confounding in the data. Because this kind of information was not in the data set. Doctors used it to make decisions and it causes the outcome. If you write the DAG, that will be something that has an arrow into treatment and the outcome, there's almost a confound. Okay. What do we know about causal inference when there's unmeasured confounding? Well, you all know that's not easy. So we have a problem. And, and, and like the high level philosophical problem is when should we let the humans override the algorithms? Why, why how can we ever justify it? And how can you even study this when there's compounding in the data? Okay, so my first point is that, yeah, causal inference requires strong assumptions. There may be compounding, but that doesn't allow us to just escape from the causal question because the question was still causal. It was the best, what is the best treatment position? Does the doctor make, make better decisions than the algorithm? We have to take that seriously. Okay, so first of all, we have to study the causal effect. We have to define it and we have to assess the conditions that allow us to study it. And if there's unmeasured confounding, what do we do? Well, this talk will be a bit about that. So one thing is that in certain cases, some of them I will study here with examples, um, we can do things even if there's unmeasured confounding. So there are many well-known like identification strategies, instrumental variables that is like the classical one. And then we'll briefly touch on this front door criterion, like pearls, another criterion that can sometimes be used in the presence of unmeasured confounding. We can be clever and come up with these negative control methods that are more and more used um, in, in epidemiology research. So, so there are some strategies. And even if none of these works, we can still bound those effects. So we may not be able to find the point estimate of the effect of interest because there's a metric confounding, but we may sometimes still get informative bounds. Okay, and we are okay with having intervals anyway, 
because we usually report confidence intervals or credibility intervals or some kind of uncertainty. Right? The only difference with bound is that they don't go to zero when the sample size increases, but still the idea is the same. You give a bound with the cost. Of it. So this is this is all to say that we still, I think, we still have to take the confidence question seriously and we still have to try to approach this with, with reasonable assumptions, not only convenient ones. Okay, so with that in mind, I'll go a bit more into specifics and, and try to, to approach like some of the key questions here. So when or how can we combine algorithmic decision-making or output from algorithms that don't involve humans and also include the doctor's opinion? I think sometimes it's very, very reasonable. And, and what to do when there's a metric found. So I will focus mostly on an instrumental variables, I think. So the notation is quite easy. We have a treatment A. We have, we measure something in this patient. So, you know, their age, their previous disease history, all these other kind of things that we may have measured. And we have an outcome Y. So suppose it's quality of life or, or an index of being alive or something one year after. And uh, we suppose larger values of Y are, are good. So better quality of life, higher Y, or survival, higher Y. Okay, and we have some of the observations of these things from, an, from not from a randomized experiment, but some kind of observations. And since I've been talking about causal inference here, we would also use um, contefactual notation. So I let superscripts be denoting contefactual variable, which means that if I have some superscript here, G means that this is the outcome Y under some regime G. So usually we have the treatment there, but suppose the regime could be I give you treatment depending on your covariance. Uh, so I give you treatment if you're old and frail and have you know, so that several other diseases. So here it's more general than saying that what would happen when everybody or you know you're deterministically given the value. But now it may depend on, on your history. Okay, we, we assume this normal consistency condition like we always do in, in most causal inference settings. And here it's reasonable because the treatment is well defined. If you did receive a particular treatment, then your outcome in the observed world is exactly the same as if I forced it to take the same thing. So this is a bit technical case, but we need one more thing. And this is important for some of the results I do because I will relate all of this to, to stories and, and examples. But the idea is that I will distinguish between the treatment regime that you will get in the regime under this rule, G. So for example, it may say all people with previous disease of this and this and type will always get treatment. But that treatment, the regime says you should get, may differ from the regime in the observed data. You know, because in the observed data, people did whatever they want, but under the regime, they may do different things. So AG plus is what you get under the regime. AG is what happened naturally. So that's why we call it the natural treatment value. AG is what the individual would choose or what the doctor would give the individual if it was not assigned by the regime. And think about the regime as an algorithm. So AG is what the humans would do. AG plus is what the, you know, usually what the algorithm would tell you to do. Okay. And if you have observational data, the algorithm wasn't used yet. The doctors did whatever they wanted first. So in that setting, AG is equal to exactly what we observed. Okay. So let me give you an example. So consider a COVID-19 drug. Like the only thing we think about like the last couple of years. And suppose we had a drug A and this was not an experiment. We could measure what kind of drug people took. Either they took the drug or not. And since this was an observational study, that's like the natural values. It's exactly this thing. But even if they, we know we can do causal inference from observational data under assumptions, we can still think about what would happen if we fixed their treatment to something else. And that would be the idea in this hypothetical experiment. Okay, so we don't even need contrafactuals with these things. I'm just saying this in word, and some people don't like to work with contrafactuals for different philosophical reasons. Um, I think these are a bit mute, but this is a bit esoteric, but we don't need it. So I'm saying it's more general than this. We can just think about the natural treatment value or something that happens before, and it's deterministically equal to what actually happens in the data. So, I mean, this is a bit on the side. It's not, I, I make a bit of a point of it, but you know, they, they have this neuroscience experiment where they can measure 
what people would would say they would do just before they do it, like looking at the electrical impulses in the brain and they could perfectly predict what kind of decisions they would make. You can think about it in this case. That doesn't happen, you know, they haven't tested it from all kinds of decision problems. I'm just saying they have been solved for that. Okay, but that's not the, the point here. The point is the following. I want to use both the doctor's recommended decision and an algorithm when we decide whether or not who, who, who is going to be treated. So this idea of optimal regimes is kind of simple in the sense that the idea is you want to choose the treatment when an individual comes in, you measure some covariates and you want to choose what has the best expected outcome given those covariates, okay? So that's like a classical optimal regime definition in uh, notation is this. Um, so you would, uh, uh, an individual comes in with covariates L and the what, you're, what you do is essentially if the treatment is binary, you just choose the little a that maximizes this expectation. So you just choose the little a that seems to maximize the, the expected outcome for that injury. Okay, nothing fancy in a point treatment design. What I would suggest is this, which is just a slight tweak. For every individual that comes in, you don't only maximize with respect to their measured covariates, but you also ma maximize with respect to A. So this sounds a little abstract because you have a little A there and some A's here, but the idea is that A was their intended treatment. So the idea is the following. You could ask the doctor, if the doctor makes a decision, what decision would you make? This is A prime, given the patient's covariates L. And then you give L, L's, and a prime to the algorithm. And then the algorithm uses the information from the doctor in addition to all these measured covariates. And it's decision theory 101 to, to show that these regimes I suggest here will always be better or equal to the, the algorithm. So why didn't people do it? Let's, let's see later on. I think the reason why people haven't done it that much, some people have actually done some clever experiments, but it's the fact that you need to operate with this AG plus together with this normal at the same time. And you don't see those in diagram plotting. Okay, so let's do another example just to fix ideas. And, and this is something that's been asked where, where these methods could be used because it's from an instrumental variable study. So David Card was a Nobel Prize winner in um, economics in 2021. And he got the Nobel Prize because of his work on instrumental variable together with Guido Ingrid and Josh Angler. So. So, but the point was this, one of his main data sets, they applied it, and one of them was this. They wanted to see if starting college maximized future earnings, because they're economists, so they think about you know, this econ outcomes. Okay, and they couldn't just look at the association between starting college and, and future earnings, because it's obviously massively confounded. Like, who goes to college? Those who are maybe more talented or more, you know, they have good families, so they get into colleges and so forth. So what do they do? Well, they understood that, or they claimed they had a good instrument because they looked at community colleges. So these are less prestigious American colleges where you get in uh, often with less, you know, you didn't have, don't have to that, have such a strong academic background. And they're often kind of cheap or heavily subsidized, but people often go if it's convenient and close to where they live. So if they, this is more for people from not the, you know, the richest backgrounds. and and. And they claim that using the distance to the closest community college really affects whether or not you start the college, irrespective of, of your other like, other things that protect uh, predict the outcome. So that's how they did the analysis. They got through with it and all these things. So suppose that's right. Okay. And later on, this has been this data sets and ideas have been used um, to um, study. Okay, we can now study the effect. Yeah under some conditions, the effect of going to a community college in a certain population on future earnings, and they found like a considerable effect of that. But then people also wanted to do, oh, but it may not be the same effect in everyone, you know, like we know that for certain individuals dropping out is very good. Huh? Look at all these big, uh, the rich guys in the, in the tech industry. I mean, almost all of them have been dropouts from, from major universities. Okay, so so they wanted to condition a lot of variables and see condition on these things. Uh, is it good or bad to go to university or a community college? 
So the idea I'm adding on is the following. So they can measure all of these things, their age, their race, their you know, education from, from beforehand. That's what they did in these studies and IQ levels from certain tests and stuff like that. But you can also ask them a simple additional question, which can be the natural treatment value. Would you like to go to college? Do you plan to take college education before you, you, you say that they should do it or not? If you add that extra question, you, the intuition should be, of course, you learn more. Okay, motivation is the big deal. Um, and there may be other unnecessary reasons why they want to do it as well. Okay. But one, if you go back, and I just want to show that, like it's, in, it's possible, that's why this is A prime and, and the optimal decision is A. It's possible that some people say, yes, they really want to, but the algorithm later on says, no, you should, right? And in the same way, it's possible that with this approach that um, it's possible that the doctor says, yes, I really want to treat this patient. So we'll have a, a real example later on, on on ICU units. So whether or not the patient should be sent to the ICU immediately or not. And you can ask the doctor and they say yes. But it's possible that the algorithm tells exactly the opposite. Okay. So that's a bit, it's not very, it seems a bit, people may be an easier on that. Okay. So the doctor, the, the doctor, you ask for their opinion, and then you say, sorry, I'll do exactly the opposite, because you said this. Um, and this is true. That's not really good. So what, what this method here then can be useful for is, is something uh, of perhaps historical interest. So anyone knows who this guy is? I would never know, but maybe you're more impressive than me. So this is um, Semmelweis who is important uh, in medicine, and especially because his work on hygiene. And, and what was his life like? Why is he important? Because he saw at his university, I think in Hungary, I should know, um, that uh, in Budapest, uh, that um, a lot of women who had some obstetric complication a lot of these women, they had an obstetric compl complication and they were sent to ostensibly the best hospitals in the city. They had a lot of complications compared to those in, uh, women that just stayed home or didn't have the money and stuff like that to go to these good hospitals and they didn't, weren't in the same environment. And essentially his idea is then, okay, even if everybody wants to, or everybody's recommended to go to these best hospitals, that may actually not be a good idea because they just get this, this infections just afterwards okay because all of them got this um this this famous obstetrical fever just after being treated sorry just after being in the hospitals many people got that so his his claim is that there's something wrong here he sees that there's something bad about getting into the hospital which was the current state of the art at the time and and after some investigation to declare that this was due to bad hygiene in the in the surgical room Right? Like they didn't do a proper hand washing before they did this obstetric um, um, small surgical or procedures, at least some small procedures, maybe, maybe we won't call it surgery, but they got infections in their uterus. Okay, so this is well known, but the point is, if we can somehow detect that certain decisions we do are not good, and, and people may, they, there may be more of those, then you may do something with it. I mean, I know another example. I mean, at some points, I think maybe it's, I don't know exactly how many years ago, but when I was in med school, we learned about it. It was like maybe in the 80s, um, kids were, were uh, encouraged to be lying on their, on their belly instead of their back. Uh, and later on, that was seen that that actually caused mortality in certain things. Yeah, they, were, um, they stopped breathing. This is obviously a very small proportion, but it can happen. That's why this is maybe interesting to, to know about. Here's another example about something that's related but different, because there's all about this like AI and machine learning to do prediction in, in medicine. So if you go to, for example, these nature journals where they are translational, for example, nature medicine, um, they would and they would often show images like often radiology here it shows pathology and they would often ask the question so if a doctor is assisted by an algorithm do they make better decisions or do they come to the, a better diagnosis essentially so this is one uh, from a pathological sur surgical pathology journal where some doctors pathologists were given um, the images 
uh, like this, histology like this, and others were given histological images where the algorithm has had pointed out suspicious region. And this is like a very classic way of doing research in this domain these days. Uh, give it something with, with, um, with help from the algorithm and uh, see which one uh, gives them better results. Um, in this study, they claim, yes, it's better. In this, this case, they claim it's better, but this is a different game. So the game is different from the following reason. In this setting, the algorithm is not giving the diagnosis. It's definitely not giving a future treatment decision. And the same with all the radiology things. Uh, you give radiological images to a computer algorithm and it tell you what the likely diagnosis is or a spectrum. But this is kind of different from using an algorithm as a decision tool. And what we agree is also different in the sense that here, the algorithm gives something independently of the doctor and then doctor uses what the algorithm says. But we think it can be even better if the algorithm is maybe trained this way to do things independently, but the algorithm uses the image. And in addition, the doctor's intuition before getting help from the algorithm, and then they can make even better decisions. So that's where it's like a small distinction. Okay. Now back a bit to, to causal inference and, and, and graphs that you may, some of you may know better than others, but the graph here is showing a classical instrumental variable setting. And why is this a classical instrumental variable setting? Well, that's because we have an instrument C that is in, in this previous example, it was uh, the distance to the community college uh, that causes the outcome A here, um, whether or not they get education, but they claim that they didn't cause the outcome earnings in other ways, which may be dubious, but well, maybe we have a better example later on. It's not my example, but there may also be tons of unmeasured confounders and also some measured confounders of, say, here, taking college education and future earnings. Okay. So the problem in this graph, which was a classical DAG, is that we cannot distinguish between the treatment that people took and the treatment we want to give under the regime. AG plus is the, 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 one, the one we want to give under the regime. But if we draw the swings, so these beautiful graphs developed by Robinson Richardson now around 10 years ago, we can actually visualize how these new regimes, so how we want to assign treatments in the future as a function of what we measure, the covariance L, that's what we usually have done, but also about what people would naturally do if they could choose themselves. The blue arrow. Okay. So swings are really good. I think they should be used much more, but that's another, uh, that's another talk. Um, so I said this in Word already, but here is the statement slightly more formally, and it's an easy result. It's actually known, known from similar settings before, and it three lines to prove is that if we do these super optimal regimes, as we call them, where we use not only L, but also A to make decisions, then we always do better than if you only use less than or equal to speaker. And the proof is easy, but I don't need to go through it now. You can get the slides if you want. But this is not necessarily interesting itself because it just says something about content factors or superscripts there. So I can just say there exists results, uh, regimes that are better than what people usually do, but then people have to ask the next question. So can you find these regimes? Can you identify them? Because if not, they exist, but if you can't find them, then it's not very interesting. So the next point is, if you have a binary treatment and we can figure out just this conditional counterfactual outcome, so this is just like conditional mean under some intervention. That we need often to find normal optimal regimes as well. If we can find this one, then we can also find the other. And this is important because I gave an example from a special issue from JASA, Journal of American Statistical Association from, from now two years ago, if we are in 2023. Um, and it means that if we apply these results, we have a guarantee theoretically that we always do better or equally good as they did in their stuff, just immediately by this, this, this small result. Okay, so um, this is the identification result. And again, I give it here more of a, of a reference and it's not really uh, important for, for any of the main ideas I'm giving here, 
But all I'm saying is that if, if we can identify this mean, so this was what we saw before, then we can also identify the condition, further conditional amount. And this is right, the main intuition. But again, this is technical details, not the main point here. But this is also a result that's related to stuff that's been done several times before. The key thing is to bring these things together. And it's also related to some results on, from different domains, from computer science, somehow also from the social science and advertising um, um, domain, where they also do some statistics and experiments. And, uh, and now also a bit from medicine. And the idea they have had in these experiments is that instead of doing a normal randomized trial, where you randomly assign people to treatment or no treatment, you also give a third arm, where you say, in this third arm, you let doctors do whatever they usually do. So you have a three-arm experiment. In the third arm, you let doctors do whatever they usually do. And if they do better than any of the other arms, then they, there is something they use that they aren't able to get the results. Okay, and, and these ideas that I've just given orally have some uh, implications and I state them because it's not obvious from my fast presentation, but it's good to know. So if the, a superoptimal regime, one of these regimes where you also use the doctor's opinion is better than the optimal regime, then you actually know there's unmissional compounding in the day. And if you don't, so then you know the doctors use something that you weren't able to measure. Otherwise, the regime could be better. Okay. So it really means that you can only do better with the doctor's opinion if the algorithm doesn't measure all the things that are relevant. Somehow makes sense. And if we have identification and there is unmistakable power. So suppose identification means that you can figure out the causal effect, right? So if you do instrumental variables or front or something like that, then the optimal, the super optimal regime you find, if you're clever and do it in this way, then it actually gives you more than what you would give just get just from an experiment. So this is like a strong if there, if you have identification in the experiment, you're guaranteed to have that in the observational data, usually not. You get some additional things. And, and these guys who did these trials with three arms, they really leveraged that because they said, you lose something if you only do the experiment. So let's include this third arm where people just do whatever they want. Okay, so let me consider this example. So we gave one about um, future earnings and education. Let's do a medical example that we are um, studying at this moment where, which has also been like studied in instrumental variable settings before. Um, and the data here are from the UK. So in a one year period, they looked at people with deteriorating health that were assessed whether or not they should be admitted to ICU quickly or not. So we define prompt ICU admission as A, which means getting to the ICU within four hours from, from, from the time they entered the hospital. And that's also quite massively confounded with their future outcomes. In the hospitals, you hopefully measure a lot of these things, but again, there's a lot that's, that's captured by the doctor's intuition. So the doctors decided or not, this is an observational study, whether or not they should be admitted to the ICU. And the outcome of interest here was death within seven days, essentially within the hospital period. And we also know a lot of these, the measured covariates here. So for all of these that come in, you have, of course, their age, their gender or sex, their, whether or not they, they had sepsis, you have to care for that. So far is one of them. So we use that and, and period arrest and, and future, also previous diseases. These were, were the ones used here. But they use as an instrument the following. So they say, okay, whether or not the person gets admitted to an ICU really depends on how many other ill patients there are in the ICU at the moment in time. The threshold is fluent in that phrase. And that's independent of that particular patient's characteristics. Okay, and using that as an instrument, um, they looked at the effect of, of admitting everyone versus no one. That's what they did before. So in our approach, we can do the following. We say, we use the covariance cells, what they measure about the individuals before they came in. Um, we also use the following. We use essentially ask the doctor the question, would you admit this person to the ICU if you could choose? Using that in addition to this, the, the algorithm, we may get to something even better. And the preliminary point of myths says that we do, 
so so this is the um these are very ill patients as far as i i get it so this is the um, survival in these patients, whereas 24% here in, uh, under the regime we suggest, 21% if we only use an algorithm, and 19% if, if we only follow the doctor's opinion. But again, this is an observational data. We should take it with a grain of salt. This is more an illustration on how the methodology can be applied. Okay, so now I would talk a little bit. I, I said, okay, you can do sometimes, you can do something with unrestricted profounding. Here, the claim was by Lou Thiel and someone else that have done studies on these ICU data that the current bed occupancy is, is as good as an instrument. But sometimes you don't have instruments in the same way. Um, and what can we do then? So one idea, which I think is somehow underutilized is using bounds. And the reason why they're un underutilized is somehow also reasonable, if I say somehow, because Bounds, they're often quite uninformative in, in what, um, in the language that, that, um, that um, we use like um, in, in common language. And I'll say that briefly here. So it's considered to be informative when the lower bound and the upper bound covers a normal bound. So then we are essentially saying, we don't know if the effect is positive or, or negative. So suppose you have some kind of lower bound this calligraphic L and some upper bound, this calligraphic U, if they cover zero, then we don't know, okay? But that, that's kind of, yeah, we don't know, but if that's all we know, then we know that we don't know, we still have to make a decision. We have to make decisions under uncertainty all the time. So should we make decisions even if we are not sure about the effects? Well, we have to. So there exists some formal decision theory results for, for making decisions in these settings too. And, but the way I present this is still a bit simplistic because yes, we have to make decisions, but, but, but maybe we were too liberal when we came up with this criteria for the balance. So maybe we actually know more, but we weren't really able to encode it in the perfect way. So we can get to something more, more sharp than this. But all I'm saying is that that's, that's the way of thinking about it. And without going into details, there also exists these, these uh, formal criteria for how to make decisions with balance. So, Minimux regret is like usually used, uh, but there are also something called like an optimist, which would always do whatever has the highest upper bound. A pessimist would do whatever has the highest lower bound. And then you have this healthcare decision-making strategy, which is essentially what is used by FDA and, and, and others when they approve drugs because they're conservative. And they're conservative in the sense that they will only choose a new treatment if it's better, if it's guaranteed to be better than the current treatment, which means that the lower bound of the new treatment is better than whatever you have, though exactly is the case at the moment. So all I'm saying is that these these kind of there exists some theory for these things, but it's not very much used. Okay. But um, now let's go to an example again to see how this can somehow how these regimes we now consider can somehow give something addition to to what's was usually done. So this example is from Balki and Pearl. So Pearl, the famous fossil from sky, and Balki and Pearl, this pa paper is famous. The reason why it's famous is because it came up with these so-called Balki and Pearl bounds, which are used um, quite a lot, actually also in uh, I, um, instrumental variable settings. And they had an example, and their example was also medical. So they had data from a randomized experiment. And the, in this experiment, 450 villages in Sumatra were randomly assigned to getting vitamin A supplementation or not. And if they got it, parents of small children were encouraged to, and they were given this vitamin A to give it to the kids. Okay. Um, but the problem is this vitamin A supplementation was randomly assigned to villages, but whether or not the parents really took it was another story. Many people didn't. And um, they really wanted to know what is the effect of taking vitamin A from these villages versus not. So since there's a lot of non adherence they couldn't really identify what would happen if everybody took it versus not. So Balkan Pearl used, used this example. Um, and, and they say that we, we have a perfect instrument, which is what they randomly assigned to. In this case, set equals zero means that they didn't get 
the village didn't get vitamin A supplementation. And then we see that nobody in this village, um, um, essentially we don't see it here because this, these are the outputs, but they're like 0%, so 0% um, died and 0% survived. Okay, so it means zero people, zero people actually got vitamin A supplementation if the village didn't have it. So essentially it's saying it's only possible to get it when you are in the treatment arm, which is one-sided compliance, which is quite common. But what we see here also is that there are many people, close to 20%, don't really take the treatment, even if they were anonymized. So if this is all the information you have, and you really want to know what would happen if everybody took vitamin A supplementation or not, all you want to rely on is randomization, okay? Then you can use the bulky pearl bounds. And what do they look like? Well, bulky and pearl found these bounds. So these bounds, so here, um, this difference means that, um, a negative difference means that the survival is increased, right? So you can reduce that here. Okay, so they say it could be some, so these are small numbers, but these are important numbers because there are deaths of small infants. Okay, so the true number of deaths, the difference in true number of deaths is somewhere in this region. Okay, so they say, okay, it could be as high as, 20%, it could be really harmful, or um, it could be uh, just close to 0.5%. But the interesting thing is that they could only bound these things. And without relying on any other assumptions, it's just a feature of this one-sided compliance, we could actually get point identification of this thing. So what is the causal effect among those who actually wanted or took vitamin A in the data, okay? And we find a point estimate that it is actually beneficial for those in that group. So what is the intuition? Why is it possible to get something point identified, conditional on taking treatment, but not in the full population? Well, this is a known, this is essentially the same as what's called treatment effect of the treated. And this is point identified when there's only one type of compliance. So in this setting, it means that Balkan and Pearl gave these bounds, which are quite wide, but we, by using the same correct, we can say, but what if we look at the effect among those who actually want to take vitamin A? And then we can say, well, we can actually point that by this one. And it is beneficial. So then the next question is, what is the effect among those who said they didn't want it or didn't take, didn't take it? So when A is equal to zero. Well, that's another story. Because we don't get anything for free. I didn't add any assumptions. So then we get... Um, even wider bounds for this thing. So all we are doing is spreading this certainty for this bound into something. So a subgroup where we actually can make decisions and say, yeah, it's beneficial. And another subgroup where we have to say we don't really know. Okay. So this, the idea here has been uh, now presented and, and 45 minutes, are, they're soon done. Uh, so I, I think I'll wrap up. Um, so what I've done today is introducing these super optimal regimes. And, to be clear, super optimal is a bit of a pretentious term, but it's all they're just saying that we can do better than the classical optimal regimes if we also use the doctor's intentions or the individual's own intention. And that we can show like mathematically, yes, we can. Another, you know, and often in practice, it doesn't require a lot of extra modeling, which suggests that it, in practice, it can also be better sometimes. Um, uh, but the guarantee is clear. It's almost, it's always as good or better than using only the observed covariance, and they will always be equal if there's no unmeasured compound. So it's all only gives you something extra when there's unmeasured compound, which often is the case if the doctor has extra information. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is my group, um, which is growing um, at EPFL. And a lot of this work has been done together with my postdoc, Aaron Sarvet, who you'll see in the future as well, because we'll soon be on the job again. Um, and reach out, please. Feel free to want to work with us or discuss.